Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and joined by my two co-hosts, Michael Hall. What's up, everybody? And Michael Reed. How is everybody doing today on this fine evening? And we are also joined by very special guest of 1067 host, Grant Paulson. Grant, we're huge fans. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yeah, my pleasure, fellas. Thanks for having me on. How you guys doing? Doing fantastic. And one of the first things that we have to get to you, Grant, uh, regarding the Washington football team is the reaction to the latest news that's developed around the team. And the first one being the name change. What was your immediate reaction to them rescinding the Redskins name and going with Washington football team? So for me, I've kind of felt for many years, like eventually the name was going to change. So I think my perspective on this has kind of been shaped by the fact that I was preparing for the inevitable. Like I was preparing myself all along psychologically Mm. for a really sad thing that was going to happen in my (laughs) opinion, which is ultimately my name of my football team is going to be different. And in some way, now that's going to change your memories and your fandom and make it kind of weird. It's, it's not as bad as some of these teams, fan bases that lose their team altogether. But when you change the name or something dramatic does change, I think it's, uh, it's something major you got to wrap your head around. So I felt like it was going to happen for a long time. I'll be honest, I'm stunned it happened this fast. Mm. Not in the sense that, you know, it's been decades and decades that people have been talking about it happening. But then it just happened overnight, right? We went from like one day a few months ago this really wasn't that much of a story on the front burners to it became a story. And within 72 hours, it was pretty clear they were going to change the name. So I felt like over many years at this glacial pace, we had this conversation where no quote unquote progress was made for people that wanted to change the name. And then overnight that happened at a time of reckoning and, and pretty obvious introspection in the country. I totally understand the name change. I've said on the air many, many times, I probably, if it was up to me, you know, would have changed the name a couple of years ago. Uh, It's not that I would have advocated to do so. I'm not a guy that has not used the name. I called them the Redskins until the final minute they were the Redskins. Um, And it would have been okay with me if they were the Redskins for 50 more years. I just understood that there were people who didn't appreciate it and like it. And I thought that was kind of the path of least resistance. So that was my take. Now, specific real quick to Washington football team. I loved that decision. You know, people Mm -hmm. that are crushing them, I don't understand. It takes a long time to get a trademark and to do this correctly. They were going to rush what should have been basically a six to nine month process in a few weeks. That's what people wanted to do before training camp. I thought it would have been a huge mistake. They had to get this right. They need to do something that the fans can be excited about and rally behind. I actually think they're doing a good job right now by involving the fans. They should be tapping into like people that want Red Wolves or Warriors or you know, uh, foxes or whatever else is, is going to be the next thing that people care about. Um, three toed sloths, you know, whatever right. it is like they should be engaging all of these people for a year and building up to this and making it a massive announcement in the off season after this season. So I think this is really, really smart. I dig the helmets. I think they're hot as hell. I think the, you know, the look's going to be good. It's kind of throwback. I like the old school burgundy and, and gold numbers on the, the gear. So Let's rock. Let's see how they play this year. And and a year from now, I'm looking forward to seeing what they end up naming the team. Yeah, I 100% agree. I I think that this was the right way for them to go about it. Did you happen to see the one name that got thrown out there the other day that the uh, Washington football team Twitter posted? The Washington Rexes? The what? No, I didn't hear The Washington Rexes. About Tyrannosaurus Rexes. Everybody was commenting. We might as well just call them Washington Rex Grossmans. That's gross, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. My first thought on that would be that the emblem on the side of the helmet should just be Rex Grossman's face. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I'd be completely cool with that. Like, so would I. Oh, yeah. Grossman is one of my favorite guys I ever covered. He really? was really, really smart and fun to talk ball with. But he also had this personality and perspective of a dude who does not give a – bleep about anything right (laughs) right i remember having a conversation with him one time in the locker room where he was a backup and there was a chance he was about to play i'm trying to think of what year this was regardless i asked him something about if you're gonna play and he he basically was like i'm gonna bleep and throw it to aldrich 75 yards downfield at first play like (laughs) that was his mindset i just i loved grossman but anyway i didn't see that that's pretty funny yeah, yeah. It just goes along with the uh, the other ridiculous names that have been put out there. But Grant, the other thing I have to get your opinion on was the Darius Guy situation. Now, 
Do you agree with the way that Ron Rivera and company deal with this kind of situation? Did they? Do you think that they were too quick with their decision? It's a really, really good question. It's complicated for me. My easy answer is, yeah, it was a little quick for me, honestly, mm-hmm. from a societal standpoint. I'm very big on uh, innocent until proven guilty. Now, this is not an allegation. It's an arrest. I understand that. Right. Uh, and, and they didn't do anything wrong, I want to say this first, by cutting him. Hmm. You know, if I get in trouble, not that kind of trouble, ideally ever, but if I get in <laughs> some type of trouble, my company could fire me the next day. And exactly. a lot of companies do that. And that's their prerogative, right? I understand how and why this happened. You go back to the Washington Post story. You're trying to send a message that you're cleaning out your your cabinets and you're getting rid of all the, the bad uh, chipped plates and cups and you're changing your culture and then this happens and you got to make moves. So I, I know how we got here. I if, I if you're asking me very honestly, was I a little bit uncomfortable with how fast he got released based on the arrest? My answer is yes, only because what I was told at the time, and I don't know if this is 100% true, but from his side of things, his attorney is at least confirmed this publicly. I, I heard they didn't have to or didn't do a ton of digging on this. Like they found mm-hmm. out, they said, well, that's awful. And they cut the guy. And yeah. That does scare me a little bit. Now, some of the details that have come out since are awful. I think it's important to remember the victim here is the alleged woman who was involved in this. Like, I'm not doing a, a, I like the NFL player, so you got to stand by him bit. I don't play that game. But just as a general rule, we're moving in society closer and closer. And this is a little bit of a hot take. But to a point where, like, the accusation and the arrest is as bad as the conviction. And I just don't love that. In this particular case, I understand why it happened. I will also offer you this. I think if it was Terry McLaurin or it was Dwayne Haskins or it was Chase Young or it was Landon Collins, I'll bet you he wouldn't have gotten cut right away. Um, And I think it was a much easier choice to make based on his injury history and how crowded that running back room was. Yeah, now I have heard rumors. Let me get your opinion on that. I have heard rumors that he admitted to the team what he had done on Thursday. Does that change your mindset at all? Well, yeah, here's the thing is if they had a thorough discussion with him and mm-hmm. looked into you know, the particulars or if he let's just say, let, let's just use your hypothetical. Right. If he told them what we found out about in those court documents and I, unless you guys want to go there, I, I don't necessarily have to. But <laughs> I mean, it's really, really tough stuff to even read. It's stomach right. turning. So if he confirmed to them that he had done that and they cut him, well, of course, I, I have right. no issue. I'm basing this off of what the team has said. Mm publicly which is basically ron rivera said said if we're wrong i'll take the blame which i love that he said that but he did he made it seem like they were rolling the dice a little bit with how quickly they moved right. and the attorney for geis has said that the team really didn't do a thorough investigation right. in any way and just kind of cut him based on the uh, the arrest but yeah if they knew what we found out in those documents to be true based on a, let's say geis saying that that happened while i find that hard to believe because he's at least in the court of law saying it's not true, right? Uh, then, then I would feel very, very different. If he says, yeah, yeah, I did this, you can't you can't have that guy on your team when you're trying to, to change the culture, or even if you're not, I don't know if you can have right. that guy on your team. Right, and then let me, uh, to wrap up the kind of negative aspect of things, you're, you were on the beat with the Washington football team back in the day, and so I wanted to get your opinion on the WAPO article and everything that had come out with that. Um, how surprising was that to you? It was surprising because, you know, disappointing maybe more than surprising, I guess. Um, Surprising because of some of the names that were in it are guys that I had relationships with personally. And uh, I believe that good people can do bad things. You know, I believe good people can make mistakes. Um, It certainly doesn't mean like I would never talk to those people again or anything like that. But, you know, when you get to know someone on a personal level and you have great interactions with them and, and then you hear stuff like that, it's tough. Uh, mm-hmm. It is. But what's disappointing to me is, I, number one, I don't think this is the only place where that happened. Mm-hmm. Now, it doesn't mean they shouldn't clean house. They did exactly what they should have done. But I think this is probably something, honestly, that happens in a lot of sports organizations or male dominated offices. And that's sad. And we got to try to fix that, I think, societally, uh, number one. And number two, you know, you, you go back to that situation um, and the story itself. I just was so uncomfortable with the days leading up to it and all the leaked 
right. fake stories about what it was going to be and this crazy speculation who was involved and why and what they did <laughs> that it felt like when this thing came out everyone was like well oh uh it's just that and th- yeah, exactly. that made me feel awful for the like the women that had come forward right. so right it was a brutal thing, man. And as a fan of the football team, you guys are, so many in this town are, you just want to, you want them to make it easy for you to root for them. Yeah. Days like that don't do that. But look, they got rid of essentially everyone named in that story. Yeah. And, uh, and Ron Rivera's pleading with people to give them a chance moving forward. And, and that's what I'm going to try my best to do. Yeah, absolutely. And let's move on to some football talk, Grant. Let's talk about the Washington football team and kind of gelling what we had just previously talked about with the departure of Geis. Who do you think is going to be the featured running back of this offense? So it's going to be Peterson early in the year. I think that's fairly obvious, assuming there's no injuries or anything like that. He's very comfortable in this offense. Uh, New look offense now that he'll pick up very quickly with the first team reps and the ability over the offseason to study. I think this is an offense that he's going to be uh, able to, to feel like is a fit pretty quickly for him with the way he runs and what Scott Turner is going to ask of him. The beneficiaries, though, obviously, are Bryce Love, first and foremost, who's going to be a, getting a chance now in year two of this organization out of Stanford to, to get some touches potentially. And then I would think you know, Antonio Gibson, who I hope they move all over and use as a Swiss Army knife out in the slot and line him up at receiver a little bit. Could mean more touches for him. Maybe all of a sudden a guy like Barber makes the team who you wouldn't have thought would, or McKissick right. gets a little bit more involved. I think AP, though, to start the season, totes the mail. And I think if Bryce Love gets some of that burst and explosiveness back as a former 4 3 5 40 guy, he, to me, is the dude as this year goes that could emerge as the playmaker at that position. And if you guys right. listen to me, you know how I feel. I mean, I'm a big proponent of playing young guys. Yep in building seasons like this. So if he shows something, I think he should get looks. And, and it's not to say that you're wasting carries with Peterson because he serves a nice purpose. Right. But if love is healthy and he's got some game left and, and his knee responds well, I really hope that he ends up get, getting a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, you just brought up the young guys on the team and sticking to the offense. There's a lot of young pieces on this offense. Uh, speaking of Dwayne Haskins, we've talked about him on here a couple of times on, uh, previous podcasts and we us three think that he'll be taking that kind of second like next step in his uh development to that kind of i heard you guys talking about the tiers of quarterbacks on your show we think he's gonna end up maybe that bottom third tier or bottom second tier high third tier by the end of the season so i just wanted to get your uh kind of expectations of what he's gonna do this season and also if he does take that step how long do you think it takes for this team to turn it around and become a uh perennial playoff contender i mean if he makes the leap then i don't think they're far off at all to be honest quarterback play in this league is just so vital right and and it looks when the quarterback is struggling you look like you're miles away and we saw that last year honestly it wasn't just haskins by the way you know the position in general after his big performance early case keenum wasn't lighting it up either and and you saw colt mccoy before he got hurt unfortunately um, when your quarterback is not thriving, and it's not always just the quarterback, it, it's a product of everything around him, a team looks like they have no shot. It reminds me of like baseball and starting pitching. Like yeah. you go through the rotation one time and everyone gets shelled, and that team looks like they're going to lose 100 games. The next thing you know, you get four or five quality starts and a trip to the rotation, and you're playing good ball, and everyone's like, well, this team's pretty good. I look at quarterback the same way. So mm-hmm. I think Haskins has set himself up to do what you guys are talking about. If he doesn't break out this year, it's not going to be because of his offseason. I mean, he is basically with a, a, a videographer and, and someone taking pictures of him. He's shown you exactly what he's yep. been doing all offseason right. on social media. He's cut weight. He's working his butt off. He looks like he's in incredible shape. I mean, those aren't necessarily things you worried about. I just think they're indicative of a guy who's taking this opportunity really mm-hmm. seriously and who probably understands after last year. Not all his fault. But that up until really week 15, things went badly. And Mm. then after that, turned around. I mean, the way he played in in week 15 against Philly, awesome performance. Week 16 against the Giants for that first half, you'll remember he got hurt on the first play of the second half. Mm. He was marvelous. And my issues, my concerns, my worries last year were a lot of accuracy things and just kind of um, like pre-snap, you know, where the ball was coming immediately, you know, getting that ball out fast. 
he was doing those things those last couple of weeks and to have had multiple head coaches and basically two different offenses and flux at the receiver position and to get where he got at week 15, it allowed me to go into the off season feeling a lot better about him than I did say a month earlier. Um, so I feel like he's ready to take the step forward. My concerns now are if you want to talk about him, namely, I mean, still, I haven't, you know, we haven't seen him on the grass spinning the football. Right. Everything he's done is great, but he's got to show that he is more accurate and that the techniques improved a little bit. And that's just natural year one to year two stuff. How much help is he going to get? Mm. You know, you, you lose Trent Williams at left tackle. They didn't replace Trent Williams. Their left tackle right. position, in my opinion, right now is a weakness. That's not ideal when you've got a young quarterback in a show me season. That doesn't help him. Uh, the wide receiver position with Terry McLaurin <laughs> as a lead option outside of McLaurin is a major concern. I think McLaurin's a baller. I think that guy's going to be a yeah. stud for a long time. Like that's the guy whose Jersey people should be buying right now. I think in this mm -hmm. offense or on this team period, if it's not Haskins or chase young, but who else do you have? You know, Sims may be in the slot without no Kelvin. A big loss. Like it's a big question. So right. for a young quarterback, you need help. I'm not sure if he has enough of it. It's also tough Two offenses in two years. But I think he put in the work. I feel way better about him today than I did a year ago or, you know, halfway through his rookie season. Mm. I'm not sold by any means. I'm not, like, confident and 100% sure that he's going to make that leap right away this year because I think there's some things still working against him. But I give him a chance to, and uh, I got my fingers crossed because I, it seems like he wants it, man, and he cares. And, like, I, I just I, – I like players who care, and it seems to me like Dwayne Haskins is that guy. Yeah, and I think the one question that is being um, ruffled and thrown under the rug is Scott Turner. I think he is another person that, you know, as much as his father has an input on this league, he ha isn't proven himself, in my opinion, as offensive coordinator. Now, Grant, you just alluded to losing Trent Williams in the offseason. So the Washington football team drafted Sadiq Charles in the fourth round. They have Jaron Christian returning, and they also picked up Cornelius Lucas in the offseason, who's a swing tackle from the Chicago Bears. Who do you think is going to win that starting job, or do you think it transitioning halfway through the year? Yeah, I think you're going to have multiple guys, if not three different starters, honestly, at left tackle this year, which isn't a great sign. That means kind of like I always say, if you have two first basemen or two goalies, you don't have one. You know what right, I mean? Right. Um, like people like like platooning first baseman. It's like, well, if you had a first baseman who hit 30 bombs and 300, you probably wouldn't need to platoon anybody. Yeah. Um, See, so yeah, I think you're all maybe all three of the guys you just named are gonna are gonna start. Mm. I would guess, and this I have no insight on this. I have not talked to anybody about this particular position with the team, but I would guess Lucas gets the first shot. Mm. Uh, he's played in the league at tackle. Now I've talked to some people with the Bears, uh, both who covered them and kind of around the team, and their point is that he's he's a nice like flex tackle and a right tackle and a pinch. They don't love the idea of him on the left side, but I think he at least gets a look see. Mm. then maybe you would try Christian, you know, depending on his camp and pre and, and preseason. I don't, I don't know that it's a guarantee that like all three necessarily make the roster. Right. So we could reevaluate right. this in a few weeks. Um, and when I say preseason, obviously there won't be games, but I mean, kind of like you're, you're scrimmaging, you're, you're good on good 11 on 11 type stuff that they're going to do to supplement that. But I guess it's a long winded way guys of saying this. If Sadiq Charles can play, he should be on the field by the end of the year. Mm. Uh, I don't know if he can, you know, I, I, uh, I, I rely on Logan Paulson who used to play for this team who is great watching film. And I send him almost like these homework assignments to help me out with guys because <laughs> he's an unbelievable evaluator. He really is incredible. And like, he has some takes on Charles where he's got some, he thinks he'd be an awesome guard. He's not quite sure about him at left tackle, but, um, yep. but if he can play at left tackle, I'm going to sound like a broken record this is the kind of year to me where he should be playing in the second half of the season. And you just yeah. let it ride and see what happens unless Lucas or Christian looks like a, a long-term answer. And I, yeah. you know, I'm skeptical of that. Yeah. Uh, Cornelius Lucas was surprisingly rated pretty high last season, according to pro football focus. Now, I'm just going to ask you something real quick, Grant. I know you've, I've heard you make the comparison to baseball a couple of times. I know this is a little off topic, but I'm also a diehard nationals fan. We are. I just want to know how good is Juan Soto right now? How amazing has he been? Yeah, I wish we could just talk an hour about Juan Soto. <laughs> Actually, true story. So, like, yesterday, uh, was it last night? or 
It was one of the nights he homered, which is all of the last four days. So whichever yeah, one it was. About to say. <laughs> pick, um, pick one. Right. So I, I'm sitting on the couch and like my wife came into the room and I'm like screaming. She's like, what are you doing? You're going to wake up the baby. I'm like, oh, Juan Soto hit a homer. And she's like, oh, you love him so much. I'm like, yeah, I do. And she's like, you would kiss him on the mouth. And I'm like, yeah, eh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I don't like anyone as as much as I like that guy outside of my own family. Um, mm-hmm. Now, with that weird analysis out of the way, the dude is unbelievable. <laughs> uh, here's what I love about Soto. And, and having talked to him many times now, his story is incredible. If he was just an okay player, I would dig the guy. Right. He comes over from the Dominican. He immediately learns English. Uh, you don't have to do that. He wanted to do that, to, mm. to be a better teammate, to be a better family member. Um, because he had a, a relative that was here. Um, I mean, he was less than 20 doing in- interviews on the radio in English. Mm. And I do shows uh, about prospects on, on MLB Network Radio nationally. And, uh, you know, you can't really get prospects on that show who aren't from the States typically because of, you know, it's just hard for them, right? If there's a, yeah. if language, there's a language barrier and, and over the phone, it's very difficult. And like Juan Soto was comfortable doing that in basically overnight. I mean, he's just... Wow. Mm. He, whatever he does he, he just he does it really really well and uh he cares a lot about being great at and at one point in time that was just kind of in, ingratiating himself culturally and and you know making sure that he could you know communicate as, as well as possible with all of his teammates and things but on top of that we did an interview with him and the reason i bring all that up is to say he was on a, the show with me and danny one time on the fan and uh i asked him something about uh, i said look you've played like 51 straight games like, is it time to get a day off? He's like, oh, no, no, I don't need a day off. I'm like, but just take one. You're hitting 400. <laughs> and he's like, no, nah, man, I'm tired of being poor. And I just, mm. I just freaking loved that line. You know, mm. it, if you hear him talking on the air and you don't love him, right. I don't know what to tell you. And oh, by <laughs> the way, then you watch him and he's a robot sent from another planet who can do right. things that no one else can. He's got the two longest homers in the National League. He spits on pitches that nobody in the game that's been there 10 years spits on. Nice. Just the quality of that bats, the ability to get on base. I, the I cross grab. Yeah. yeah. Dude, the, 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 the grab and the shuffle. Drop, the kicking the dirt around with the shuffle. <laughs> Carrying the bat first to rub it in Bregman's face. <laughs> that, was, that was the best. I'll I never, lost my mind at that yes, moment. I'll never, ever, ever think anything's cooler than that. Like, yeah. did anyone do that? <laughs> right. Seriously. Right. Like, the, and it, and it was the Astros, and it was Bregman, and it, oh, it was just perfect, you know? Absolutely perfect. Now, but to bring this up and to finish off the interview, we have to rope this and bring this back to the Washington football team, Grant. Now, I ask this to each one of our guests that comes on the show to wrap up, and I'm going to ask the same to you. If there was one player you could pick on the Washington football team right now that you think is going to have the biggest impact under Ron Rivera, it's going to take the biggest stride from being under Ron Rivera, who would it be? Oof, that's a great question. Um, wow, let me think for a second. So, you know what I'm going to say is Montez Sweat. Hmm. Uh, I know. don't know that it's necessarily just because of Rivera as much as also potentially Jack Del Rio. Right. Look at the numbers of guys the year before and the year after Del Rio got there. Yep. Those great edge rushers that he worked with, Von Miller and Julius Peppers. I think they're going to be smart in how they employ him. I think they're going to get him looks, moving him around that he maybe didn't get last year. And I also think naturally, let's say they weren't here and Jay Gruden still was. Montez Sweat came on like gangbusters at the end of the season. Yes, and yeah, because it was a lost year and they, were, they weren't playing that well as a team, I think people sleep on that a little bit. Yeah, like right. the second half of the year, Montez Sweat compared to the first half were two different guys. He added – I think close to like 12 or 15 pounds this off season. If you see pictures of him, he looks like an action figure. Yep. And the dude's massive. Uh, I just think he's primed to break out. And you got Chase Young, who's going to need a lot of attention. Obviously, 91, Ryan Kerrigan's still going to be making plays. Uh, but if you're asking me like the next three years, you can buy stock right now in someone who's about to have a meteoric rise, I would go with Montez Sweat. Yeah. And that's a 
It's it's a great answer. Julie uh, Donaldson on Thursday actually came up with the same one. So great minds really? think alike, and that's good company right, to be cool. in, Grant. And Grant, I know you you have a million jobs. I appreciate you for taking the time out yes, on top of you spending time with your family. For you to be able to take this time out and to come on our little old pod uh, means a whole lot, and I appreciate that because we I can't tell you enough how big fans we are of your work. Yeah. No, it means a lot. I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys listening, and uh, no, I dig it. I mean, I you know. This is uh, the the fan base. I grew up a fan of the team. My wife's a season ticket holder, you know, and um, we, uh, you know, we want to see him do well, too. So I get it and I appreciate it. Uh, Of course, Grant. Thank you so much. Have a good night, sir. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. All right. See you guys. Take care. All right. Bye. Woo, that was a lot of fun, fellas. We got a lot of great stuff um, from the Grant H. Paulson, the prodigy, my friend, came on. Absolutely. That is our idol. That's yes. the, that's one of the reasons that me and Kyle started this show. Yep. It's, yes, it is. It's because of yeah. Mr. Grant. The and reason I started listening to 106 was because of Kyle and because of Grant. Exactly. Yeah. And I didn't want to make this negative, but so like, all right, the first time I ever called into radio, I called into 106, you know, like I always thought about calling into the junkies. I always thought about calling into to Chad Dukes and Grant, but I was like, you know what, like, I don't know when I'm going to do this. So one day, there, him and Grant, uh, Grant and Danny are having a conversation about Tim Tebow being with the Philadelphia Eagles. Chip Kelly brought him on. And so they asked callers, all right, guys, call in. And why do you think T- uh, Chip Kelly brought Tim Tebow to Philly? So I was like, you know what? This is my time. I'm going to do it. I'm going to call into Grant and Danny. If I'm going to call into any radio show, this is the one. So I'm so nervous, dude. Like, I'm on hold for like 15 minutes. Finally, like, that bell rings. Like, ding! and yeah. like you're on and so i was on there and i just say you know like he was gonna maybe chip kelly wants to use him as a kind of uh, rpo option for the wildcat kind of a system in case the quarterback gets hurt or whatever have you they and eat you alive grant starts says starts listing he says danny start listing me quarterbacks and he starts danny starts listing literally random quarterbacks backup quarterbacks and grant's like i take him over tebow i take him over tebow i take him over tebow <laughs> and and i was just like literally just destroyed me and i was sitting here thinking i was like I'm not saying Tebow's good. I'm just saying why Chip Kelly would bring him on. <laughs> so, like, first time I called in, I was just completely destroyed, you know? That's so funny. I could totally see you just sitting there like, <laughs> all right, <laughs> thanks. All right. <laughs> like, I, cool. up. Yeah, <laughs> I couldn't, like, the mess the thing is, like, I couldn't do the rebuttal, you know? It was, like, the immediate right. hang-ups. So it was kind of right. like, dang, dude, like, I wanted to say something back. Like, this is messed up. That is so funny. <laughs> that is so good. Uh, but... You- the transition here, we did have a couple of pressers. We yes, we did. Pressers from two of the Redskins' biggest players. We had Terry McLaurin and Montez Sweat speak to the media. They both had some pretty interesting things to say. Uh, it, it's especially Terry McLaurin. Terry McLaurin was asked about the new offense. Uh, he said the offense has been really smooth so far. He says that he likes the aggression in the scheme. Uh, he also feels that Washington's new offense is clear and concise. He said that helps out everyone from the quarterback to the mm. receivers. I love hearing that because that just means that it's easy for these guys to pick up. This is something that where there shouldn't be a, a, a hard time with the coaches communicating between the players, the players communicating between each other when they're on the field. And I, I think it just means that they were picking things up smoothly. Of course, Terry does have a football IQ that's higher than a lot of people than your average player. But I, I love this quote from him. What do you guys think? Yeah, and I think he's absolutely right about that. Hearing clear and concise is absolutely perfect because, you know, I feel like this offense that Scott Turner is bringing, it kind of gels all of the quarterbacks together in a way. They all bring little added positives to each. You know, Alex went through this in Kansas City, having the kind of pre-snap motion offense, uh, everything geared towards that and then you talk about Dwayne at Ohio State having a similar type offense and then Kyle Allen working with this offense last season with Scott Turner so it just seems like this offense is best thing possible right now for this team Um, you know as much as I want to sit here and say that I'm not confident in Scott Turner himself um, I, I like the system I think the system really goes to everybody's strengths everyone offers something yeah I mean you hit the nail on the head um a lot of the pre-snap motions is what's going to make it a lot of like more clear and concise pre-snap, which obviously, like you said, it's going to benefit Dwayne who going back to last year, a lot of people said that his main struggle was um, getting it in and out of the huddle, which obviously is going to get cleaned up because the verb is not as long as it was with Jay Gruden's offense, but also kind of getting that pre-snap rate of the defense and kind of 
the in snap motion of the game of the defense. So uh, yeah, just uh, things like you said, it's gonna make everything easier for uh, a young offense, which needs a lot of things kind of toned down and watered down for them. Right. Looks like without a preseason, obviously. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think by hopefully by week three to four, this offense should be hitting the ground running and hitting strides that uh, we haven't seen from a Redskins offense and since probably Kirk Cousins. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of a young offense, uh, Terry McLaurin was asked about Dwayne Haskins, and uh, he did say that Dwayne did a very good job of helping the receivers coordinate workouts. The connection mm. between Dwayne and the other receivers was apparent to McLaurin. Uh, he said that he, on, off, on off-season work with the fellas, he said that Haskins' leadership really stood out. He helped hone the quarterback-wide receiver connection with Haskins and the other targets, and he praised Haskins for coordinating, once again, the throwing sessions with him and Washington's other wide receivers. He said that really helped us get off on the right foot and that I've been around Dwayne for a long time and not that he wasn't working hard previously, but it's just a different type of intensity and focus he's had. And I just think that he is echoing what we've heard about Dwayne Haskins all off season. Just the fact that he is putting in work, he, he's getting the guys together and he's really taking Ron Rivera's leadership advice and using it. And I'm excited for it. Yeah. And he's actually putting it to good use. You know, he's actually being legit about the leadership aspect. I mean, listen to Terry right there talking about Dwayne was helping getting organizing the wide receiver workouts. That's incredible. You know, you wouldn't have thought that was possible uh, looking at this team last season. So the the stride and the movement of Dwayne mentally is moving at light speed right now, and it's so good to see. Yeah, uh, obviously it's well documented. Grant talked about it when we just had him on that his offseason, he's had a photographer and videographer with him, and he's been taking pictures, putting videos out with different receivers, in the league and all out of the league, aka AB, and uh, yeah, for him to say that, uh, for Terry to say, <laughs> for Terry to say that uh, he did a good job coordinating uh, the sessions with the receiver and stuff like that. Uh, I heard a lot of people kind of criticizing him for not throwing with his actual receivers of the team and getting jailed with them, but it just goes to show you behind the scenes, he doesn't have to put everything on camera. Worried about and Corona? The, yeah, that too. But I mean, it, again, it goes to show that he's taking the initiative and. He said he would like to be a captain this year. And uh, I think one of his quotes before was he wants to get the respect of the team. And the way to get, be a leader of the team is to get the respect of the team. So that just goes to show you he's trying to get the respect of his receivers right now and uh, all the coaching staff and just get on the right page. Yeah, and it would make a lot of sense for him to go only work out with opposing teams wide receivers. If they get corona, you know, yeah, sorry. That's true. Yeah. yeah, that's what they do. But speaking <laughs> of uh, wide receivers that are on the team, he was very impressed with Antonio Gandy-Golden. He said that he's very athletically gifted. He pretty much jumps out of the gym. He plays faster than what he may look on a, on a time watch. He also advised AGG to be ready to compete because he doesn't have to sit on the sideline as a rookie. And I think he's completely right. AGG is going to have every opportunity to yeah. win that wide receiver spot opposite Terry McLaurin. And he's saying exactly what the wide receivers coach says, and that's he plays faster than what he was timed yep. at, at the combine. And that's good to hear, man, because that, that was the one thing was everybody that kept him from going higher? Was everybody was talking about that four six forty, and, and he looked faster on tape? Apparently, he's just somebody who, on the football field, his game speed's a lot different than his time speed. I mean, there is nobody else you would rather AGG talking to right now than Terry McLaurin. Exactly. You know, tr- transitioning to the NFL, trying to help with route concepts and route running, uh, that is the perfect person to be able to talk to. And thank goodness, uh, you know, Terry sees something in AGG. And look, AGG, I've, I've said it before. I believe that this is his job to lose the number two wide receiver position. He fits exactly what this coaching staff wants in a wide receiver, a big, strong target. And that's what AGG is. The only thing is it's up to him to win that job. And look, at with his personality that we've seen from afar, I don't think that'll be an issue. And thank goodness Terry doesn't either. Yeah, I um, mean, I said it before. I think that they're going to try to use uh, AGG like Kelvin Benjamin, but he'll be Kelvin Benjamin 2.0 just because I think that he's more mentally in shape and mentally tougher than Kelvin Benjamin where he'll actually be able to, like, stay in shape and be able to get the offense down pad. And you see, you said it before, like, for someone that size and uh, that big to be keeping up with guys in the field that are running four threes and four fours, it just goes to show you that, again, his 40 time, yeah, that knocked him down which clearly was a good thing for Washington because they were able to draft him in the fourth round. Yep. If he would have came out and ran like a 4-4-40, he would have went in the second round probably, so he wouldn't even have been there for Washington. Right. So that's definitely a great thing. And 
again, with him being drafted in the fourth round and people kind of putting the low expectations on him, like you said, it's perfect for him to be around Terry because Terry was drafted in the third round. He didn't really have a lot of uh, output at Ohio State because all the weapons around him. People thought he would just be a great special teams guy that could maybe evolve into a great receiver somewhere down the line. And with the work ethic that Terry McLaurin has and the kind of mindset, is, I mean, for someone to be around him and soak him up like a sponge, it's going to be great things for the receiving core going forward for years to come, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, we're going to do two more Terry quotes before we move on to Montez Sweat. One of them I really like. It's, it's a kind of long one, but it's about Ron Rivera. He said, this is his exact quote, he hit us with a pretty big message today. This is before, of course, they went out to practice. He says he hit us with a pretty big message today. Not to get all the way into it, but the way we came out to the field each and every day is something that we can control. Our attitude, our preparation, and our effort are the three things that we can control on a day-in, day-out basis. And we're going to be a physical football team that is going to attack people on both sides of the ball, and it starts up front with the offensive and defensive lines. So that's what you want to hear out of a coach. That's kind of what I've been accustomed to in my background playing football, just that attack style of play. I think it's going to suit us well, as long as everybody continues what we're doing so far, allowing ourselves to be coached and continue working to get better. I feel like we can make strides necessary to be ready for week one. I love that before their first practice with helmets on, Ron Rivera gave them a motivational speech. Terry, of course, didn't get too much into it. But from what he said, that's what you want to hear. Yeah. It all starts up front, which is what we've been saying, which is what everybody who plays football everybody who coaches football knows it starts with your offensive and defensive lines and the fact that not only are they going to be aggressive on defense but they're going to be aggressive on offense and that's only going to help us with a strong arm quarterback like Dwayne Haskins they're going to be taking shots downfield and I love that I'm excited for it look everyone is going to interpret that quote meaning that the offense is going to be attacking downfield I don't view it that way. What I think Ron Rivera is saying is what we are going to be running the ball down people's throats. We're going to be punching them in the face and we're going to be able to move people at will because we'll be attacking them hard. And look, I absolutely love this. And the fact that, you know, like you said, Reed, before they do their first padded practice, you know, Ron Rivera is talking to the team, setting the tone and the expectation. This is such a, a fresh breath of air uh, in contrast to what we've had before in the past you know, with the soft uh, kind of practices with Jay Gruden and then Jim Zorn and Mike Shanahan. This is a complete change of direction. And like I said with that Michael Jordan quote about practice, and if you can't keep up with me here, then you can't keep up with me in the playoffs. That's how I kind of view this. And thank goodness that there's a change that, like right here, Ron Rivera's bringing that culture bringer, baby. Culture bringer. Woo! Oh, I didn't even notice that shirt. I <laughs> yeah. love that shirt, Kyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I think you PRM sent it to me, buddy. Now, I think you guys are both right. Uh, I think it's definitely, you're, Kyle, you're right. It's going to be definitely a run, attacking run offense, like a lot of power, a lot of zones to uh, Peterson, and hopefully Bryce Lovey can emerge and be that guy. But I also think Reed is right where they're going to be attacking downfield because obviously if you're pounding the ball down your throat, you're running the ball well, it's going to open up the downfield passing. Yep. And again, just going back, obviously everyone knows Terry got that scary speed. And if AGG's out there keeping up with four or three guys and that good game speed, I mean, his offense has the potential to be, I'm not going to say deadly, but it has the potential to surprise a lot of people in with no uh, preseason Fire games. Power. Yeah, with no preseason games, I think the, the Eagles coming out week one, they're going to get hit in the mouth a, 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 a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it, he also did say, by the way, that he respects the fact that Rivera was willing to take responsibility for the Darius Geis situation, which I thought was huge that the players noticed yeah. that. I mean, we knew that he would. But the, the last quote from Terry that I thought was interesting was that he was working with Odell Beckham Jr. this offseason. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said he actually came up to me and talked to me for a while. I'm kind of a guy that lays back a little bit. As I kind of get the sense Terry is. I feel like Terry's not exactly the most outgoing person. Right. But uh, he said... I try to just get my work in and not do too much, but he came up and told me he respected my game. And he asked me while we were running routes to give him any tips that I may have seen and what he was doing. And I asked him, him the same thing. So how, how huge do you think that is that a superstar like Odell Beckham Jr. Somebody who has had extraordinary success in this league, no matter how you feel about him, whether you feel he's overrated or not respects Terry McLaurin and then was asking him for pointers on his route running. That's one thing that, Chad Ochocinco talks about all the time on his Twitter. Go to Ochocinco's Twitter right now. Sweet read everything that he says about Terry McLaurin's route running. That it's it's amazing to see that all these 
superstars are asking Terry McLaurin about route running and to give him the pointers and advice. Yeah, and because look, a lot of people think that route running and route and running concepts has a lot to do with like your athletic ability and being able to have footwork and everything. But in reality, a lot of the time, it's a chess match. It's a mental game of being able to see little tips of a corner being able to shift their waist a certain way, being able to get them to change direction so you could go inside or outside. You know, that's where Terry is best at and being able to manipulate with his mind mentally, being able to see how a corner is going to play and then be able to get beat him to a spot to get there. The fact that he has that shows that veterans in this league are saying, okay, Obviously, it wasn't just like your speed or whatever have you. You have something else that is giving you an edge, and what is it? And that's what kind of shows with Odell. And so, look, uh, as much, and it's laughable that Odell is sitting here asking Terry for tips, and Terry didn't make the top 100. Yeah. I mean, look, we all said that everyone had Terry McLaurin's rookie year higher, rated higher than DK Metcalf's rookie year and A.J. Brown. Neither of them made the top 100. So it just goes to show you that the hate is real on the side of the East Coast. But – but that being said, uh, it just goes to show you his off-the-field preparation and the film yeah. study that he does. I mean, like you said, for him to be able to kind of see the nuances of a cornerback and how he comes in out of his breaks, what his weaknesses are, and kind of mold that to his game and be like, all right, if I come out of my break at this time, I'll beat him this spot. If I can get over top of him at this point in the route, I'm going to have him beat this deep. So it's definitely great. And going back to AGG, for him to be sitting around uh, Terry and just soaking up all of his knowledge, I mean – AGG obviously is going to get that off-field preparation from Terry himself because outside of Edmund, I don't even really count Edmund as the vet, the vet in the room. I have to put Terry as that veteran receiver in the room that's guiding the guys. So, uh, yeah, uh, lost my train of thought, so I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. It, it is also a little bit ironic that Terry McLaurin was pro football focus's highest rated rookie wide receiver uh, since awesome. Odell Book, since Odell Beckham Jr. And now they're giving each other pointers and giving each other right. advice. Hey. And before you get into the Montez Sweat quotes, I wanted to uh, briefly discuss some of the just recent news that's gone around with the team uh, before we get into that. And the first one being the Washington football team announced that no fans will be in the stands this season. And so I'm not sure if this means that it's permanent, like legit all 16 games, nobody can go, or if this can change down the road. I really hope that is the case. Try to get Burroughs and uh, Ian over here so we can have some points. Uh, and watch some Washington football. So, Reed, what is your immediate reaction? Um, I, I think you're right. I think it really just kind of depends on what goes on with COVID. Um, it sucks knows, to hear, man. It sucks. No, no, yeah, of course it's terrible to hear. But, I mean, it was kind of expected. I mean, yeah. you can't have a stadium filled with people. I mean, we see the MLB is already having issues with it, and they don't have fans at, at right. their games. It's just people making bad decisions off the field. So, of course, they're not going to have fans there. I think it is definitely something that could change. Like, who knows? Maybe they – Somehow they get a scientific breakthrough and they come out with with some sort of vaccine or something. Then I think at that point, maybe they would allow people to begin to be able to come in. I don't think that's going to happen. So it's just it's going to be different. It's going to be are they going to do the same thing that baseball does where they pump noise into the crowd I'm into sure. the speakers, which I would imagine that they would maybe yeah. put some fake fake cardboard cutouts of fans in the stands, I don't know, but it, it's 40,000 Dan Snyder little statue. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be very interesting to hear what the football players Dude. feel. If you can hear what the baseball players say, imagine what the football if players say. Did you hear what Steven Strasburg said earlier? Yes, yeah, Strasburg got kicked out of the game yeah. from the stands. Yeah. <laughs> that was hilarious. Dude, I think, honestly, if they do allow, like, the caricatures to be put up, like, uh, whatever at the games, you know, they offer fans, I think somebody should send in a Bruce Allen picture uh, that yeah, would be I hilarious saw some, i saw some on twitter where they were saying that uh they're gonna have like people they're gonna have like uh in the stands kind of like the virtual thing that nba is doing where mm. groups of people they're gonna call them like pods of people and they're gonna place them in the stands as far as like groups of people watching the game together oh like nice that. and that'll be like the crowd or whatever i don't know if they're gonna do the sound probably think of the sound but uh i just find it weird that the stadiums in Landover, Maryland, not DC or like Virginia, and Baltimore is also in Maryland. But yeah, the Ravens are going to have fifty percent or whatever percent right. capacity at their stadium. But over here in Landover, the same state as Maryland, they're like, no, we can't have fans here. But that's probably up to the governors and what they want to do at this point. So I kind of understand it. Uh, I think I guess it's kind of an advantage point because I mean, everyone knows the insert. 
they don't even go to the stadium junk here anyway. So uh-huh. it, it, it keeps the opposing fans off the stadium at this point. So. Such an uh, annoying joke. The only yeah, the know. only the only time that uh, that actually works is like with teams like Jacksonville that literally like couldn't even sell tickets at all. I mean, they were having they were having national blackouts. Come on, the right. Redskins game yeah. is not getting blacked out. And then I, I said this yesterday on Twitter. You can follow me at the Burgundy Zone. Um, I I said you know. I would much rather have go down this route with no fans than I would with no football at all. You know, yeah, as, as much as it sucks not not being allowed to go see, you know, other Redskins fans, hang out with uh, friends that we've come across and being able to watch Redskins games up close and personal, it sucks. But at the yeah. same time, I just want football to be on. Right. Yeah. And, and and one thing is I, I know that the Ravens are allowing 50%, like you said, uh, as of right now, 50% of attendance. Let's not forget, though, that the Red Sea, the Washington football team has actually been one of the leaders in terms of doing things first. They're, mm. They've been they were the ones who offered up their stadium for COVID testing. They're the ones who canceled the scouts going, leaving the state to go do scouting They're So maybe this is going to end up being a trend where the Ravens end up saying, you know what, we can't have people at our at our stadium either. Who knows? I mean, the the Washington football team always seems to be out in front of stuff. Yeah. And then the, the next news that was released today was that Julie Donaldson has added London Fletcher London. to, to the game day coverage of uh, obviously a linebacker that Washington football fans covet. Uh, and that's a great person to be able to bring on. We talked about in our group chat, having a guy like a sideline reporter, being able to talk to players and then also giving pre and post game uh, reactions and predictions. I think London is absolutely perfect for he's very well-spoken, a very driven individual. I think he'll do a great job being added to this cast. I think he kind of brings the leadership that they need. Yeah. And especially like who knows more about football than London Fletcher. I mean, that's why yeah. he was able to play so deep into his career is because he, he, was never the biggest obviously he we all know about his size and, and he never luckily never really got injured but his football smart his football iq was just always off the charts so he's going to ask the right questions he's he's going to see the right things he, he's the, he's very well respected from the players so I, I think it'll be i think that was a perfect addition to that crew yeah uh, i think it was another home run hire by julie i know everyone was crushing the d hall hire but at the end of the day, he is from the DMV, from Virginia. He has grew up a fan, so it kind of makes sense. And Same with the, blame him for not wanting to win Super Bowls with the pick. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. I mean, look, he took a shot, like you said, when the team was down. It was kind of like, really be all. But, again, like you said, who wouldn't want to get like, – I mean, I thought, I'll call him dumb for making his decision over Russell Wilson. <laughs> yeah, that's right? what you yeah. said. You were like, you shouldn't be admitting that to people. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, what? You shouldn't bring that up to people. <laughs> <laughs> but uh no, nah, I mean as definitely like you said it's a home run hire by Julie and uh like you said his IQ is like really, really high. Uh so he's obviously gonna like know what's going on pre snap, after snap, and I'm gonna miss Clinton Porters as that kind of on yeah. the field kind of guy. I mean, I don't know if he's still doing it or not, but I'm gonna assume probably not. But uh yeah, I mean, what a better guy than replace Clinton but then uh, a long time Redskin as well. A well-respected Redskin like London Fletcher. Yeah, I'm pretty sure uh, Portis or is like Washington in the middle. Uh, pretty sure Portis is like in the middle of like a lawsuit right now. Yeah, too, yeah. So. as yeah. I was saying, it, I kind of remember that. I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, Portis could be getting sketchy, into a lot of sketchy trouble. Sketchy fraud thing going uh, down. Another thing that happened is that they cut ties with Chris Cooley completely. Yeah, they announced that. And uh, I will say that I have heard through the grapevine that it, it makes sense because uh, apparently Chris Cooley and I'm just throwing this out there. I just from a little birdie that I know that is around Redskins park and works there. Apparently he was somebody who would be vulgar with Larry Michael. He was somebody who would openly say things that that were very inappropriate for a workplace and hmm. that's unacceptable. So of course they would cut ties with them, you know? Yeah. And, and that's what we have been wondering um, all off season, you know, where is Chris Cooley? Why isn't he talking? Why isn't he saying anything? Right. And you know, birds of a feather flock together. You know, and this kind of really, it really makes sense. I, this was really surprising to me because, you know, I couldn't imagine not being involved with the media, not doing content with the team, but cutting ties like the alumni, like saying like, you know, that sort of thing was insane to me that, you know, there was something more here. There is a reason why they are doing a complete disconnect from him. Yeah, no, when I saw that, when I first saw it, I was just like, oh, maybe there's kind of, again, a clean house on both sides, like the 106 side and the 980 side, like, just completely start fresh and over. But then, like you said, the, when I saw the alumni thing, I was like, oh, wow, this is like something deeper than that. Yeah. So it, it would definitely make sense for him to be, uh, obviously he wasn't named in the article, but for him to be one right. of those guys 
and it also kind of makes sense where like a lot of people were like why hasn't chris cooley like gotten a job like higher up in the organization yet like he's a really smart guy like as far as football and stuff like that but it also makes sense because he kind of gives off that that frat guy kind of vibe yeah, you know what i'm saying right, so right. i mean mm-hmm. it the would make good old sense boy that, mentality yeah. yeah it would make sense that he was kind of on that larry michael swag He's, he's yeah. so smart, but he can't leave his dong out of taking a picture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Come on, I said man. football smart. Not yeah. <laughs> uh, absolutely. So let's uh, let's end this off uh, real quick with a little Montez Sweat uh, press conference. Okay, yeah, Montez Sweat seems to be a man of few words, just so you know. A lot of his answers are just very short and to the point. Uh, when asked about Ron Rivera, Sweat said that every day Coach Ron Rivera talks about attitude preparation and effort those are three things that he is installing into these players heads i think that's a great thing obviously the attitude preparation and effort those are the things that you need to be successful um and i will confirm reports that i know we asked julie a couple weeks ago or was it last week if montez sweat had gotten bigger because it appeared so from the pictures and montez sweat did confirm that he said uh he did for, during his off season he spent lots of time watching film and just yeah, getting bigger right. overall for the four three which is exactly what we need he'd be bulked up for this four three to be a, a defensive lineman in the four three and he's excited for the new system in the new year yeah and that's really i'm really glad to hear that that that's what ron rivera is preaching to the pass rushers is you know intensity getting out i'm so happy to hear that because, like, you know, we've said it before. I said it earlier, but like, the lackluster kind of environment, the kind of joking, pinching the nipple kind of um, atmosphere that was around the, the park, this is a complete change of face. And uh, I'm really happy to hear this again, that Montez Sweat is just echoing what we have heard. And that there has been no, – this has been a consistent message. Tenaciousness, attitude, pride, and family. You know, I absolutely love hearing this. Yeah, um not gonna lie, I didn't hear a lot of that quote because it was a little baby running around with his hands all over <laughs> stuff. But uh, I'm just gonna echo everything you said and go with that. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Montez set. Montez Sweat had five and a half Montez sacks set. over his last eight games last season. He attributes that to having a better pass rushing attack. He felt better prepared in those games. So for his pass rush plan this year, Sweat said he developed more of a pass rush plan later in his rookie year he said he paid more attention to the strengths and weaknesses of opposing offensive linemen he also believes he got better against division opponents because he had more experience going against them so this is a classic case of a rookie coming in and just being used to being more athletic than everybody else because we know montez sweat is an athletic freak he thought he could come in here and, and just dominate with yep. pure athleticism that's not the case so he began studying film and realizing that he needs to work on his technique. He needs to work on his fundamentals. He, he needs to study uh, different things that players do. And you love to see that because the sky's the limit. He played, like we said, five and a half sacks over his last eight games. That comes out to 11 sacks in a season, which would have been fantastic for his, his rookie year. So I, I love it. Yeah, and look, I, I look. You're probably gonna get probably gonna get made fun of making this comparison, but look, football players are a lot like Pokemon cards. You know, like when you when you when you when you, when you had when you had a Pokemon, like the, the lightning Pokemon were susceptible versus water. When you had the water, you like whatever, vice versa, whatever have you. You know, I forget what it was. Don't whatever. I don't know that either, Kyle, because I had friends in school. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in all honesty, like this is what it's kind of like. Where every what he's saying is, when he went against these guys, he didn't know what to expect. And then when he was able to watch film on them, have some experience on them, and knowing what they're bad at, he was able to then take advantage of those weaknesses and get after the passer. And that's how I kind of see it. Is where he's like, look, I got the experience. I was able to see how these guys play, and I made my adjustment after that. I thought that I, you know, I didn't have anything to expect. So every matchup he went into, he played a certain way, and he ended up learning. You have to play different. Every player different. Yeah, I mean, it just goes to show you that. Uh rookies coming into this league like you said like just based off college they're just athletic freaks they're just faster than the guy in front of them and just quicker than the guy in front of them so like you said he just kind of thought coming in here oh i'll be fast enough to get around the edge i'll be quick enough to get around the edge and he was clearly rudely awakened really fast even though he was playing the run really really well but for him to end with the uh, seven sacks i had to kind of like go back and double check that because i was like what that was a quiet seven sacks but if you go back and actually watch yeah. the last, like you know, said, the last like half of the season, I mean, he was really coming into his own and really kind of like breaking out of his shell and getting on, getting on, getting on top of the passer a lot and 
Get again, on. playing the run, get, uh, and then again playing the run really well. So uh, yeah, I mean, I'm expecting big things from him, him this year. Uh, Julian Grant, that's their breakout player, and uh, yep. I expect him to definitely break out. Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, I think that that was a great pick by both of them, and. Of course, add Dwayne Haskins or add Montez Sweat to the list of people that's just completely enamored with what Dwayne Haskins did this year. He had nothing but great things to say about him. Uh, when asked about Chase Young, Montez Sweat said everybody looks good. He said he thinks everyone has improved from last year. And with the new additions like Chase Young and Kendall Fuller now on the team, he's looking forward to see what this defense accompl- can accomplish, especially with Jack Del Rio, he says. Yeah. Jack Del Rio is just letting them get after it. Yeah, his word. I heard that quote and I heard that was, I, look, I don't want to kill the guy, but it was such a bad question because he asked him, because he basically <laughs> asked him, who is the standout player so far in camp? Who, what is Montez going to say? You know, like, right. Right. like he's not paying attention to what other guys are doing really and he's not going to throw anybody under the bus try saying like someone's better than somebody else you know that's why he was kind of saying like everyone looks good that's why he said that yeah yeah i mean i mean look we got five like first round picks and second round picks and all that stuff in there so i'm I'm expecting to look good and yeah i mean like you said he's not gonna throw anyone under the bus and be like oh yeah this guy's better than him and this guy's really gonna have a better season than this guy i mean Again, he's Ron Rivera is preaching the whole team unity and family thing. So why would he try to divide and try to put one guy against another or kind of boost one guy against another? So he's like, yeah, Chase Young yeah. looks good, but Ryan Anderson looked terrible. But yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah Ryan Anderson's probably going to get cut. You know, he's mad. So. Right. That's obviously he's not going to do that. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, also, with all the, the kind of the, the what, 10, 15 pounds that he's put on. It's kind of weird. Like, how much more does this man look like Julius Peppers now? It's like crazy. Right, yeah. He did the very similar frames. He said yeah. he started last year at 260, ended the season around 250. Right now he's at 265. Uh, and he does look a lot like Julius Peppers. Except that his two front teeth touch. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not like a straight hand. Uh, on. Right. Um, but uh, like I said, Montesco was is a man of a few words. Yeah, you're, Julius Peppers did too. Oh, okay. Um, but um, uh, being a top. I was like, wait, did I make that up? <laughs> <laughs> like, like I said, you don't get much out of Montez Sweat's quotes. He was just very short and to the point, but he did have some good stuff. So we have two more quotes from him. Uh, on being a top defense, wow. Sweat said, overnight, we're not going to be the best defense in the country. That was his quote. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> I do like that he understands that it's going to be a process. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. you got to put in work, as he said. But that was literally, that's where the quote oh, ended. That's great. That was it. And, and I just love Montez Sweat for being that guy. I got nothing for that. My, yeah, I'm going to be quick in the points with my analysis of that quote. I like it. Yeah, exactly. Right. Good. <laughs> I like it. Good, good, yeah. good, good. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, and then another one. <laughs> this is another straight to the point one. Uh, asked about the D-line. He says, if everyone does their job, the sky's the limit for this group. That was it. <laughs> a little bit longer than last. Dude, he's, he's Belichick think, in that thing, man. Yeah, oh yeah. And I think that is uh, right. I mean, you can't disagree with that quote. Right. So, yeah, good. Awesome. You're right. Good yeah, job, yeah, Montez. Yeah, I, I, thumbs up on that one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and it, look, and he looks great by that presser. You know, we were able to watch it and see that he looks really good. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. That's going to wrap us up for this show, everybody. Thank you so much to Grant Paulson for coming yes. on to the show. Definitely. You can go and follow him on Twitter at Grant H. Paulson. Um, everybody, I'm Kyle. I'm Hall. You can follow me at TBZ Money Mike 301. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Funny Danny. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> Oh no! Yeah, I'm gonna go with that. That's all. <laughs> oh, yeah, funny, Danny. Oh man! First Twitter uh, handle name ever. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> all right, and everyone, like you, go follow me at the Burgundy Zone. Um, thank you so much for tuning into this episode, everybody. We'll be back again on Tuesday for a fresh, new, brand new episode, and hopefully, we'll have more insight hey, onto the Washington quick. Football Team training camp. Kyle, talk about something. You're doing something special coming up here soon, aren't you? Oh, yes. Thank you so much for reminding me. Uh, We are having a joint podcast episode of all of the, I guess you could say the, uh, well, a couple of our close guys that we do pods with, being the Washington Brawl, uh, the DC Tweet Team podcast, and then I think, what is it, Washington Football Addicts now? I think he's going to be, and that's going to be on the 24th, I believe, which is a Sunday, right around midday that should be getting released. And look, that is going to be a great product. 
yeah, yeah. yeah. great nice crossover the show I'm definitely looking forward to that yeah that's gonna be a blast all right everyone thank you so much for tuning in member go like it like us on facebook subscribe on youtube itunes good pods you can find us on twitter like we said instagram and facebook thank you so much for tuning in everybody washington football <laughs>